Welcome to the latest episode of Talking Shinmu, where we break down each episode of Shinmu the Animation with members of Megavisions and the Shinmu community. This week, we're joined by anime voice actor Jay Hickman, who recently voiced Zonquan in Shinmu Episode 7. We're happy to have you on the show this week, Jay. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. It is a pleasure to be with you and, and excited to now be part of the Shenmue community. That's Yay. awesome. So before we jump in, uh, you know, kind of talking about the, the episode, we definitely want to talk uh, to you about, uh, you, you know, your, your uh, kind of your career, how you got started sure. uh, in, in voice acting. Can you, can you introduce us to, the, uh, to our audience and, and kind of get us up to speed on, you know, where you got started? Yeah, glad to. So I've been I've been working in in anime for close to twenty five years now, um, and it all started um, in Houston. I was acting professionally. I had you know done some work on the stage in Houston, and through that met other actors who had agents in town and talked to me about doing that. And so I learned how to get an agent. And upon doing so, I was starting to get work doing you know, local, very small time, you know, TV commercials and radio commercials. And then started through this agent, started doing, uh, you know, uh, other voice work uh, in addition to the radio commercials. And so I, I'd been working, you know, professionally as an actor, both on stage and screen and voiceover for a couple of years when I saw in the, in the back of our um, alternative weekly newspaper, it's called the Houston Press, there was an advertisement uh, on the back page that said wanted actors to vo provide voices for cartoons. It was that plain. And so um, <laughs> I uh, I called that number and got voicemail and left him all of my information. Like I'm Jay Hickman, I'm a local actor. I would very much like to, you know, talk to you about your, um, you know, your ad and please call me back. And I, I never heard back. Um, and about two months later, flipping through the paper, I saw this ad again, or one that was very much like it. I don't know if I recognized that the number was the same or what, but I called them, uh, got voicemail again, left another message with my info, and uh, never heard back. So uh, fast forward like one more month, and I am at my girlfriend's apartment. We're having lunch, and she is flipping through the paper, and she's like, oh, look. It's an ad for uh, actors to do cartoon voices. This would be perfect for you. <laughs> right. And I'm like, I, I know. Yeah, I, I think I've seen that ad and it, it doesn't look like it's in the cards for me. So I'm, I'm going to take a pass. She's like, well, I think I'm going to call them. Uh, she was also a performer. Um, and so I was like, go for it. You should. You should definitely give them a call. So she picks up her uh, cordless phone and uh, beep, boop, boop, beep, beep, boop, beep, boop. And just hanging on the phone, and then all of a sudden, yes, hi, hello, yes, uh huh, yeah. I was calling about the ad in the back of the paper about um, uh, voices for car. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, mm, yes, very much. Yeah, I would love to. Um, this Friday, yeah, I should be at at four o'clock. Yeah, I can totally do that. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, here's my uh, name and information. And uh, what is your address? Uh huh. Uh huh. Great. So four o'clock this Friday. And do I need to bring anything? Oh no. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, good. Uh, we'll look forward to seeing you this Friday. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, uh, my boyfriend is here, and he is amazing at doing voices and and does voiceover professionally. And I was just curious. Oh no. Oh. Oh. Okay. I understand. No. Yeah. No. All right. <laughs> well. Thanks anyway. See you Friday. Click. And I'm just like, what what happened? What just happened? Um, but she was like, yeah, they oh, said oh. they were only auditioning um, women. They only want actresses. They're just looking for female characters. I'm like, oh, all right. Well, that makes sense, I guess. She's like, would you mind coming with me to the audition? I have never done this before. So I would really appreciate it. I'm like, all right, sure. Boyfriend of the year. I will come with you to your <laughs> so on Friday at four o'clock. We drove to this place at the address and it turns out it was ADV films. Um, and we walk in and it's a pretty standard kind of audition room um, or waiting room kind of, you know, environment. It's, you know, whatever, 
12 by 12 room. There's chairs all around the perimeter. There are some people sitting there. Some are filling out papers. And we walk in and sit down. And in moments, a assistant, a production assistant comes out with a clipboard. She's walking around the room. And you are, and you are, and you are, and gets to us and um, you know takes down my girlfriend's information and hands her some audition sides. She's like, this is pretty easy stuff. It's just that these two pages, uh, we should be ready for you in about five, 10 minutes. Great, wonderful, super. So I, we're work, she and I are working together to kind of go through the characters and we do a quick read through very quietly in the waiting room. And then she gets called back. And so while she's back there, production assistant comes out again, going around the room and stops at me. And she's like, were you, are you auditioning? I'm like, no. Um, she's like, oh, did you, had you been planning to, did you want to? I'm like, oh, I would love to, but I understood they, they weren't accepting any new applicants. And she's like, well, uh, we are actually running a little ahead of schedule today. So I might be able to squeeze you in if that'd be interesting. I'm like, yeah, kidding me? Yeah, please. That'd be great. So she took down my information. My girlfriend came back out. We talked shop about how it all went. I told her the great news. And in five minutes I got called back and, um, you know, it was pretty, pretty standard uh, audition um, kind of setup. There was, you know, a sound booth, glass window, uh, engineering booth on the other side, uh, the director, and um, we were auditioning for a scene from Dirty Pair. Uh, and so I had a script with me, I had a video monitor, and we let it rip. And, you know, we did it a couple times. And they're like, great, thanks so much. See you later. And I left. And like a week later, I got a call to come in to do a tiny part in an anime called Master of Mosquiton, uh, which is a, a vampire show, kind of half zany comedy, half drama. Um, and so I played like a British communications officer or something. He has like one line and then he gets immediately killed. And <laughs> um, it was great uh, and I loved it. And then like two weeks later, I got a call to come back in for a slightly larger, tiny role. Uh, and it just it just built from there, um, uh, you know, to to what we have today. And so, as a as a quick denouement to the story, my girlfriend, who went through all the proper channels to get this audition, uh, never did get a call. But um, as consolation prize, I married her. <laughs> so, that's a great story. That's a pretty that's good a consolation prize, right? I I don't know. You'd have to ask her. <laughs> I, uh, I I can't speak to that. Um, but anyway, yeah, that was uh, that was the start of it. It was it was kind of crazy, and um, yeah, I just I, you know kind of ADV started to grow, and they were getting new directors, and so the directors I was working with would introduce me to the other directors, and they'd call me in for something small to, you know, kind of see if we had a rapport and what I could do, and uh, I just slowly, slowly grew from there, and, and since, you know, I've been able to work um, up at Funimation a couple of times, Ocratron, um, Switchblade Studios, there, there have been a couple that I've been able to to make inroads with, and it's been a really, really, you know, kind of rewarding uh, experience low these 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Then that sounds like an amazing career. I was just going down your, your IMDB and it's just, it's, it's so long. Like you've been very prolific and, and, and working, uh, for, for a long time. I did see on there, uh, uh, an entry for vampire hunter D. Uh, I wanted to just ask you about that. Uh, yeah. cause it shows on there, uh, that it was a re-release of that version because yeah. I, for me, that's an important anime just because that was the very first anime I ever watched. I remember back in the, it was must have been in the mid 90s, is on HBO. I think they had a, a one hour run one night of the week. It was called like uh, Japan Animation or something like that. I think yeah. that's where I first witnessed, I guess, what would have been the, my first anime, and it was Vampire Hunter D. And I just saw that. That was, and it just jumped out at me. So I wanted to ask you about it. What, what was your, what was that like? Uh, yeah, that was, that was an interesting one. So that one, you're right. It was a re-release and I, you know, and, and this is so common for, for actors, um, in this industry that, you know, these, these projects will come along and we are either called into audition or it's with a director that we've worked with many times. So they've already got us in mind as they're looking at the cast and kind of looking at the, the, um, the Japanese version of it 
thinking like uh, I'd like this person for that role and this person for that role. And so this, um, you know, what what we are unaware of as actors is kind of how these projects come to be, like all of the um, the sort of administrative bit and the wheeling and dealing and the the production um, and executive production of it. So I I understood when I first got called into the studio for this. I knew of Vampire Hunter D, certainly, like it's kind of iconic. And um, the director explained like, basically they are re-releasing Vampire Hunter D or redubbing it. And so the, you know, the original dub exists and there's, you know, it's still out there and it, you know, it's not like it got lost in a terrible fire and they have to recreate it like it's there. Sure. Um, but there was, there was some reason that was not explained to me. And again, this is, above uh, above my head but you know what what the deal was with the licensing that caused us to redo it but all i knew is we were redoing it so i was going to inhabit a role that was previously occupied by somebody else who's still around still working um so obviously you know excited by that prospect a tiny bit daunted by it like you want to do with something that's kind of so legendary in the anime world you you certainly want to make sure you're doing it justice um and so yeah the character is is greco roman who's just a you know classic movie cad yeah. <laughs> just you know he was he's supposed to be you know uh you know jerk dialed up to 11 and so Absolutely. I'll, I'll see if i can <laughs> sink my teeth into that so it was it was pretty easy to to inhabit him and just play just play the jerk um <laughs> and uh yeah i got to i got to see it later um and yeah truly it's it's stunning like even the you know original animation is still so gripping um and yeah with the the modern day voice work and uh and direction it was it was really really great to see that that's awesome. Uh, thank you for thank you for telling me about that. That was very interesting. Um, yeah, for sure. For me personally, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, you've you've worked on a lot of big franchises over the years. Uh, Shinmu obviously is a relatively new on the anime side of things. It's it's right. had a name for itself for decades in in video games. Was this a series that that you've been familiar with uh, prior to to coming into this uh, you know work here for the anime? Just a little bit. Like I knew of the game, and I had not. You know, I was not. Um, a big adherent to the game. Like I wasn't, you know, I, I've, I've been able since meet a lot of people in the Shinmu, Shinmu community who are um, just big, big fans and you know, grew up with the game in the nineties and so excited for this kind of reintroduction of the property in this new format. And, you know, I think, you know, more than a decade ago, I was playing it at a friend's house for a little bit, but like, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't kind of get into the storyline as much as, you know, more ardent players do. So I knew of it and was very interested to hear that it was going to be, you know, um, a video game that gets an anime adaptation. I don't know. You, you guys might know better than I about, you know, what the, what the precedent for that is. Like I know about, um, you know other properties that get anime adaptations uh but a video game i don't know how many of those there have been like video game to traditional western style movie that's one thing but right. to anime um yeah I, I i don't know i don't know if there's any um forebears there but i mm. did know that this was going to be something quite unique and so i was excited uh excited to be a part of it yeah, definitely. The I, I I will say I think the the Shinmu community is one of the most diehard and and loyal fan bases in all of video games. Uh, so I I think they're gonna all welcome you into the the community and you'll you'll be a part of it forever now. So that's that's very cool. Glad to be here. Glad I'll get my tattoo and everything. <laughs> Tell me where to go. Right. <laughs> um. So yeah, can you talk to us a little bit about how you came into to to actually you know voice Zonquan? How how did the sure. you know you you come into this role? Yeah, so this was um, th as you as you know this this production has um, kind of a lot of um, a lot of parties involved, a lot of stakeholders, kind of some big names, you know, uh, Crunchyroll and Adult Swim uh, as the primary owners. So Sentai Filmworks was was tapped to um, cast the English language version and then um, you know record the. Um, record the English language dialogue. So through through my work at Sentai, I was um, asked to come in 
for this particular character. And um, so it was, you know, kind of an, an entree to a project that that's similar to others I've done, except that this was Shenmue. And I understood that this was going to be, you know, very, very unique, um, particularly given that it was, you know, an original, an Adult Swim original. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm such a big fan of them just, you know, from the get-go. Um, and so, yeah, I had, I had, I think I had already heard buzz at like, you know, the excitement um, kind of out there in the landscape that this was coming. So, um, you know, it was, it was certainly different for me from that standpoint that I was going to the same studio I normally go to to record, but on this particular day, um, yeah, I knew it was going to be something kind of special. So I did, um, you know, I was introduced to the character. I did not know, like, I think I had probably on those few occasions that I had played a bit of Shenmue, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Shenmue one. And I had not yet been introduced to Zhang Quan as a, a video game character. Um, so I was, I was really introduced to him through the anime and it was explained kind of his purpose and, you know, we we at first kind of have no idea who this guy is, and he seems like a clown and just you know day drinker and like what is he up to? And then you see that there's some real depth there, um, and so you know I could tell it was going to be exciting to to explore that. So I get to you know with him, we get to be you know kind of loud and brash and um, you know uh, uh, sort of over the top, and then also you know in at different moments. Uh, pretty, you know, pretty serious and kind of like understanding the gravity of, of what we're talking about in the Wuda and kind of helping someone along in their quest and that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, it was a really neat character to get to um, to get to play play a part of. Yeah, he's he's very interesting, and we'll definitely want to get more into to him um, yeah. as we get into that episode recap. Sure, sure. Uh, but can you talk a little bit? Uh, how what's the process of kind of finding that voice for for that character you said you you watched the uh the anime and you didn't uh see it so maybe that was a good thing maybe that was a good thing that you didn't have maybe that that uh you know voice in your head and, and right. I, don't, I don't i don't know if that somehow affects you but can you talk about personally what you go through and, and how you find that voice for your character yeah absolutely and it's a great question because really the process changes um so much and it's for i think for different actors they take a different process and even for me i've i've kind of come at it from different angles um at, at various times and so yeah your point about knowing if there is a previous voice done for it the the idea of having that in your head or not is a very interesting one and some um some want to stay far, far away from that. Like they, they worry that they'll get infected with uh, <laughs> someone else's right. take on a character, and then others embrace it, um, not because, not because they hope to mimic it, but just to get a different input. And you know, they'll they'll take that and kind of um, weigh that out with the rest of of their choices for the character. So you know, one of the things that is frequently done when we're 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 producing anime in English languages, we will already have the Japanese version in studio. And so, um, you know, we are, we're playing, I'm, I'm hearing the anime in Japanese all the time just to get the cues, just to know when it's kind of time to come in. Like we've got time code to match with and we'll watch the scene so we can kind of see what, what else is going on in the scene when the character starts talking, but also having the Japanese voice in your ear just to kind of help with pace is a great thing. But but oftentimes, you know, a lot of actors want to hear what the Japanese have done with the character in terms of where it sits vocally, kind of the timbre, uh, as well as kind of emphasis on certain things, uh, emotional cues. And so um, I, I do that a little bit. I don't do that as much as others. I like to um, really find the character's voice by looking at the visual, by hearing their backstory, and then um, you know, just kind of collaborating with the director. Like many times, it's a rarity that I'll walk in and the director says, "This character needs to sound like X." Let's practice a few times so I'm sure you're doing it right. Um, it's it's more often a a, a collaborative process where I'm like, um, "This is great." 
Uh, I see the character now. I kind of understand his story. Uh, what what do you want him to sound like voice wise? And they'll have some ideas, and they'll be like, uh, these days it's funny. The the most frequent thing is uh, it'll sound pretty much just like you. I'm like oh, all right. Uh, or it's you with a little more gravel. It's you aged up by 10 years, or it's you 20 years younger. Um, and, you know, sometimes we'll we'll get a real, real character who has like got an accent or a very distinctive character voice, and we'll go for that. And so um, that's normally the process. I mean, very rarely to like, um, I'll walk in. Well, it's not that rare. It's, it's, the rarest is where the director has like a quote directive on what it should sound like. And then uh, the most common thing is something that's collaborative. And then next to that is I'll say, what do you want the voice to sound like? And they'll say, what do you want the voice? To sound like? <laughs> oh, oh no. <laughs> like, like show me, show me what you got. And so and that's fun. I mean, I, I know that, you know, I, I know that I'm not walking the wire without a net. Like they're, they're going to make sure that I don't. Sure. Um, you know, screw up the whole show by doing picking a dumb voice. So um, that that's a fun thing where I kind of get to start the discussion, and usually it'll be like, "How about this?" Blah blah blah, and then we like, "I like that very very much." What if you tweaked it with a little bit of X? And I'll try that. I'll be like, oh, "That sounds good to me." What about you? So um, yeah, this was um, this was one of those where I you know it was it was collaborative. Um, to find the voice, but, you know, I had some direction up front, which was that, you know, this is, he'll, you know, you can see by the character, like he appears at least to be a bit gruff um, and grizzled. And, you know, he, uh, he's popping a beer at 10 in the morning. <laughs> uh, and apparently he does that with some frequency. So, um, you know, kind of put that in the funnel and see what comes out. Uh, and so that that's that's pretty much how we came we came to kind of find his voice, um, and then you know kind of how he delivers uh, the content that he has to share is is kind of I took cues off of the other characters, and then you know you get to see his backstory, and so you kind of understand what he's going through, um, and so that that helped very much in kind of shaping what he would would look and sound like for me. Great. No, that, that's that's very good insight into the character. Uh, Marcia and I were talking uh, before we got started. I think uh, in this episode, it it featured that character a lot more than they did in the, in the game, and and I think it was a very well told. And and we'll, we'll jump into all that. I'm very excited to to do more of that. Uh, but I let's turn it over to Marcia. Uh, we do need to do that episode six recap real quick, and then we'll jump in to episode seven, which is really where the excitement is. So, uh, Marissa, sure. I'll turn it over to you now. Uh, get us uh, get us up to speed with where we're at in episode six, please. Absolutely. Um, so, basically, what we see in episode six is is where Shenmue 2 as a video game starts. So, we see uh, Rio coming off the boat, getting introduced to Hong Kong, um, and his bag gets stolen by a uh, little younger person, a teenager, we'll probably say 15 or 16, um, and another guy, and he basically has to get his bag back. Um, a small, uh, slight variation, as we've mentioned in previous episodes, is that um, when it comes to the video game and the anime, they do a lot of um, remixing and, and kind of shifting around certain story points or expanding upon different uh, story points. So, for example, when his bag got stolen um, in the anime, um, his money and the Phoenix Mirror, uh, which is a big focus of, of the series, also gets stolen. So there's this giant section in the game where you're trying to find the bag and you have to earn your money back because all your money is stolen. But the one um, thing I noticed is yeah. he's flashing the Phoenix Mirror like all over the place. Oh, yeah. Like out in the open. Like if you're thinking that you're trying to infiltrate some sort of, uh, you know, like Chinese... Uh, you're really in deep with the mafia and all this stuff. Maybe not show it like right out <laughs> open, Ryu. Come on. So yeah, I mean, but at least you know it was, he, it was smart of him to, I guess, keep his money in his pocket or something. You know, sure. since yeah. since they took the, the backpack. Um, <laughs> right. Because in the game, like if you know ahead of time, if you replay it, that your bag's gonna get stolen, you just blow it all on a uh, useless souvenirs, which you can then just sell for money later, because that would be um, the smart thing to do. Um, so. 
essentially he's looking for the bag we also get introduced uh to joy uh joy is a is a another big character um in the series um and she essentially helps rio um throughout the game in a number of ways um she helps him find a place to stay um you know there's an assortment of uh quests and things where he goes to her where she gives him answers um on specific things uh, but as mentioned in the previous um uh, episode uh, he's here in hong kong and he's looking for an individual named li xiao tao um and at the moment people we, we as an audience don't really know who that individual is um so th this is a this is a big portion uh, of the episode um and also learning about the wuda uh, as in the anime uh, they pronounce it as wuda interestingly in the video game version um, for the English dub, they call it the four Wudu. So I, I thought that was interesting that they that they changed the uh, pronunciation uh, of that in the anime. Um, and there was a big portion uh, in this episode about the first Wudu, which was gone, which is train yourself every day without neglect. And you see him uh, practicing on the tree and and uh, mastering the iron palm, I believe it was called. Uh, and Essentially, that episode ends uh, with us being introduced to Li Xiao Tao, who is Xu Ying. Um, Rio makes the assumption that Li Xiao Tao is a man, and he, you know he gets scolded by the monk in the temple. Um, to, you know, to you know his place. Was that? That's not a good look. For, for my <laughs> not a good look. He, he took no. the L. Pretty hard. Not a good look, and and that's basically where the episode ends um, in episode six, and then. Obviously, episode seven is where uh, we continue that story of Li Xiao Tao, uh, and basically he gets his ass kicked by her, um, and she tells him to go home. Um, and you know, because he doesn't have enough strength and all that, he goes around Hong Kong to find a martial artist who can help him with the Wu Du, and he's basically saying, "I'm not going home. You know, I'm staying here. I'm gonna make you." you know, help me and he's going to try his hardest. And this is kind of where um, we come across Zhang Quan, uh, who's a street performer. Joy tells him, right? She's like, because Joy's the one yeah. that's like, hey, I, I know this 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 guy over. I know this guy named Jay <laughs> over at the mall. Uh, he, he hangs out there. But um, so, yeah, I think that's who put him on the path to connect there, right? He there's, goes, he, there's great beer there. Right. Yes, there's amazing <laughs> beer. And that's another interesting thing that, that they also changed uh, in the game uh, because when we're introduced to your character um, in the anime, that is the first thing that, that kind of happens is, is he's basically like, all right, before I help you, um, grab me a beer. Um, in the game, they, uh, they, actually, they actually just have that uh, the second portion of the interaction, which is have Rio uh basically break the stone um and and so he can earn himself some some money so just kind of these tiny details that i felt was interesting um uh from the from the you know the people who wrote this uh, the episode and then i guess the general direction of, of um creating and expanding upon you know the characters and adding these details that i mean might not even be necessary but maybe you know maybe it's yu suzuki uh his way of trying to revisit you know the game and adding maybe details that he never um had seen before and jay i wanted to ask you about i guess um what is that what so what does the process look like in terms of you know you have the character um and then when you get introduced to the story do they give you like a whole script or a breakdown of how what the story is and where it goes or is it basically like all right this is your character and you know do the lines for these characters like how deep does it go into in terms of like the background yeah, uh, that that varies from show to show and director to director. Um, yeah. For this, I there wasn't a whole lot of of background um, given, and 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 normally for me that's not you know not necessary either. Like sometimes I'm real curious to know um, kind of the whole storyline and where this character fits in it, but sometimes you know, kind of as it is with an ep episodic show. Um, the storylines are pretty compact per episode. Like you can join at the beginning of the episode and, and not feel like you're too lost. Like you can kind of join the action that, that's currently taking place. Um, 
and um, you know, be a part of that storyline and follow that from you know story beginning to story end within the episode. And so, you know, that was that was largely the case here. I did have, you know, because I I had the opportunity to play a few other very very small characters throughout some earlier episodes of the show. So I kind of you know I was able to follow along. I certainly watched episode one from beginning to end. So I had the basics of you know, Rio and and his story and kind of what he's what he's dealing with and kind of what is driving him forward. So yeah, by the time we got to episode seven, um, really all I needed um, in addition to kind of having watched episode one and, and little bits of some of the other episodes, like I felt like I, I was pretty pretty firm in kind of where we were and, and the role that Zhang Quan would play in it. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I was curious about, I guess, the process for this um, specific um, anime in terms of recording and, and it, I guess interacting with other people who are in the same scene with you. Um, yeah. I know like in, in when we interviewed um, Rio, who uh, Corey Marshall voiced in the video game, he kind of talked about um, the process for that. And, you know, there were situations where he would just be in the booth himself and then do his lines. And then there were certain situations where he would also be, uh, the other voice actress would come in and they'd be interacting with each other yeah. and recording their lines. How, how, to, how did it look like for this, you know, uh, anime project that you were working on? For, for this particular project and overwhelmingly for, for most of the anime that I'm part of, it's you're alone in the booth. And, um, you know, if, if any other actors have recorded before you, then they'll be in your headphones. Like as much as they can, the director will play the English language performances of your castmates for you to act off of. Um, but, it, you know, sometimes you're the very first to record. And so it's just like the Japanese cast and you as the first um, English language actor. And so, you know, it's, um, Again, I mean, we, we've got a few kind of different things that help us along in terms of bringing a character and a story to life. So it's not like I've never felt and I've never heard of any of my other peers in the business who have been like, and I was the first to record and I had no idea what to do. Like, um, <laughs> generally speaking, like we can, you know, we can read along and kind of get the basics. And again, that's a that's a scenario where it's really helpful to have the Japanese um dialogue in your in your headphones because you can you can take cues from that and even if you don't know Japanese and I do not and most most of my peers do not um you can you know you can read the text in English hear the Japanese performance understand basically what they're conveying and play off of that um so yeah for this uh I'm pretty sure pretty sure Rio had already recorded uh, Austin had recorded. So um, I was able to play off him since all of my scenes are almost exclusively cued off of his lines. Um, so I had that going for me. So it was almost like we were there together. How does uh, what, what is the what is the length of time that you record? Does it take and does it happen in a day? Do they give you a couple of days? Is it the span of weeks? How do, yeah, what does that look like? it, it, um, that varies. I mean, for this, for for a a character where you kind of see the whole the character's whole arc in one episode, that's going to be a, a single day, um, and you know, a couple hours, um, probably based on the number of lines that the character has. If it's a um, if it's a major character like um, like Rio, he would yeah he would have multiple days of recording, um, and you know sometimes and it depends too. Like some some of the shows these days are performed um, kind of in a simulcast or dubcast type thing where it's like one episode per week is aired at the same time as the Japanese episode airs or close to the same time, and so those are also recorded in the same way where it's you come in one week for episode five and then you're called in next week for episode six and the next week for episode seven but if it's a you know if it's a a long spanning um series like a, a 24 episode series and they're just going to go ahead and record everything at once yeah the, the actor might show up several days over the course of a few weeks 
Interesting. That's very interesting. Um, so I guess kind of just get, get, we'll just keep rolling into the episode. So we are introduced to Zonquan in the mall. Um, and he uh, asks him to grab a beer. He grabs the beer. Uh, we do this this whole um, little little show with the stone. Um, so and I, I would I would love to ask you there in the game. Yes, is it is it understood to the player or Rio that he needs to break the stone in order to earn money? Like, is that why he does it? Because he knows that he can get money from it and needs money. Because that was I, not clear in the anime at all yeah i mean in the in the anime or in the game uh, it's basically the way it is is you you go to the the martial the dojo with his master where he is and you're trying to find the four wuda um but in that that's the other interesting thing um is that the four wuda that you are you actually learn before you meet uh master li shao tower shuying so that that is an interesting thing. What where where they're basically from what I'm assuming is the the structure is each episode has been one different uh, Wuda, and uh, you're kind of um, trying to earn Shu Ying's respect in tandem with learning these these Wuda. Uh, but in the game, you learn all four, and you then get introduced to her as a character. Mm. Um, but if in this uh, in the mall version or in the mall. Um, basically, you go up to to the character and he asks you to do this one uh, thing for him, which is breaking the stone before he talks to you. I don't know if it involved um, him earning money for it, um, but I think that's the assumption. Oh, he breaks the stone and then he, I think, pulls out a hat or something where, you know, people give him money because Rio ends up, you know, breaking the stone for him. Um, and, and then you have that arc with um, him and the master in the dojo. Um, but in this anime, in this episode, it does not go to that deep of a um, a degree of like this character being fleshed out because, and that's one of the main things I saw in, in, in like the Shenmue Dojo forum was um, they were kind of surprised that they put so much focus on on Zhang Quan as a character, and they actually enjoyed that um, very much uh, because. Some characters get like a brief cameo and they kind of go away and maybe you come mm -hmm. back and you say goodbye before, for example, he leaves Hong Kong, he goes back and visits him. But in this one, you have a full um, kind of understanding of him as a character and you just have like a whole story arc basically of him in one episode, which which I think they do a great job with other characters as well in previous um, episodes in the series. For sure. Um, Can I throw in a question real quick, Morrison? Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, because uh, you were you're talking about <clears throat> Zonquan's character arc, and, and he really started from where we saw him in the beginning. He was he was morning drinking, you know, like day drinking. And so he was like right at the very low. And then, you know, at the, at the end, you know, we see how he's kind of redeemed himself and everything like that. Uh, I would just like to ask you, Jay, what, what do you think of him as a character himself and just that that kind of arc of kind of redemption and, you know, and, and kind of fulfillment, all that sort of thing that you see with this? character yeah i mean it's you know not surprising to to learn that it's satisfying to see his arc e even over the short course of the episode but i would say too you know even at the beginning you meet this character and you're not thinking wow there's a guy who's down on his luck like he seems pretty happy with his lot mm -hmm. uh, if strangers come talk to him he gets them to go get beers for him like <laughs> what's you know what's wrong with that but and he seems like as soon as he wakes up basically and determines that Rio is not with the yellow heads, um, he's pretty cheery and personable guy. So, um, you know, you don't, you don't find out till later that he's lost something and maybe actually wants to get it back because whatever, whatever life he's kind of um, eked out for himself here after leaving uh, master Zoshan, he he seems to have find some level of contentment with it. So, um, you know, that was kind of the starting point for me. Like, this is just a really, this is a curious guy. Like, what is, you know, you're you're left wondering because he's living in a mall. He's got a rock for a pillow. He asks someone to break his pillow. So what's going to happen <laughs> to his pillow? And you're just like, what is with this guy? But he seems happy throughout the entirety of it. And then, you know, when when the crowd gives him some money for Rio breaking a rock, he's like, 
wow, this is the greatest day of my life. Look at all this money. And so just like, you know, you're at a starting point here. You're not like, you don't, you don't meet the character at a point where he's like, wow, that's really low. He's, he's at a really low point. Like, I hope he's able to climb out of it. Like he start, you start seeing him in a place where he seems pretty content. And then you learn that there is something unrequited in him. Um, that, um, that it seems like toward the end of the episode, he he wants to rectify. So yeah, it was it was definitely interesting, you know, for me uh, as the guy, you know, helping to portray him for an English language audience, like seeing kind of seeing where he stands and then understanding where his arc is going to go, or at least having a decent idea of where his arc is going to go. Interesting. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. I, I, before the podcast that we were actually debating if it was a morning beer or a mid-afternoon beer i was like there's no way it was 10 a.m i was trying to figure out <laughs> there's already people in the mall and all that stuff and i was like man it's more like a midday lunch beer but if that makes you feel better most <laughs> yes it was, it was certainly after lunch <laughs> I've seen Marson personally uh, morning drink, so he has yeah. no no way. It's a holiday <laughs> when it's a holiday. Very, on a, only on uh, holiday. Or maybe work day. Work in a mall. Day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in a mall. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, so we're kind of, um, yeah, so we basically discussed his, you know, character arc and um, Rio learns the second Wuda, uh, which is G, G, which is judge yourself without conceit and don't show your moves thought, thoughtlessly. And it's kind of like when we're we go kind of go back into like the fight that um, Zhang Quan had with with the Yellowheads, which is another interesting thing. Uh, Yellowheads were introduced uh, earlier in the anime than they were um, in the video game. Um, I believe that um, so. Yeah, so it's basically judge yourself without conceit and do not show your moves thoughtlessly. And then basically, uh, he, the we go back to um, Xu Ying, and we also had this uh, story arc um, with her kind of um, showing a, a flashback of her as a child and her crying. Um, and you kind of get a, a deeper understanding, and, and you kind of have this mirror. Um, image uh in your head when you're watching of her having potentially you know these issues with her family and i feel like she was kind of identifying with her uh in rio and and i thought that was very interesting um don't we, so we I, don't get that in the game at all is it but it, it, there is it shouldn't move in shouldn't move too that we get some sort of uh like flashbacks with there's her some yeah there's some side quests i guess if you like seek them out it doesn't necessarily mean like you'll see it in the main story there there's certain glimpses of her her background but i think they do a much better job weaving it in through um the story so you know basically this is kind of where where the episode ends um and then we are you know teased with the next episode i guess as we're wrapping up jay uh I, I know you said you had a bunch of lines that you ended up doing for different episodes Do you know specifically if you have like additional um, you know, voice lines in the future, or do you do you have it? How how does that work exactly? Yeah. Like, do they give you just like here's a bunch of lines and here's like these extras we want you to voice for? Do they it's, tell you like this is episode seven or eight? How does that work? Yeah, it's uh, sometimes it works that way and sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, I it, it so happened that for the episode with Zong Quan, um I was able to also perform some of the lines from earlier episodes. The, these other characters, basically uncredited characters. Um, but yeah, as to what comes in the future, I don't know. Um, like, you know, it it seems like, I, I understand from the video game, uh, you you meet Zhang Quan for this sort of brief little piece and then he's out of our lives. Um, and so I don't, you know, after seeing episode seven, you kind of, he, he just really seems awfully likable. And, you know, you leave it too, where, you know, he sent the letter back to Master Zoshan and he's like, I've broken my vow, but it's not going to stop me from kind of trying to get back on the path of goodness. And, uh, you know, you, the last thing you see of him is he's curled up with a good book in the mall, I presume, um, in the mall library. And, um, 
you know, you, you're kind of left, uh, at least I was like, I, I'd love to see him again. Like I'd love, I'd love to find out what happens with him. But yeah, I, I, I sadly don't know. Um, well, we'll keep my fingers crossed for a, uh, for an uh, encounter with uh, Zhang Quan again sometime in the future. Hey, who crazier things have happened, you know, like uh, in Walking Dead, Daryl became this amazing character and look what happened with him. Maybe we can whole start a new thing, bring back Zonquan and we make <laughs> him the star of the rest. Zonquan spinoff series. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, hey. that, um, <laughs> that, le that let's get Shinmu 4 hashtag is going to be bumped down by <laughs> Zonquan back. Let's yeah, go. I like it. <laughs> let's start it here today. Right. <laughs> Good. I'll sign. I'll sign that petition, and about a thousand other Shinmu related petitions that we have probably waiting in the back. All right. Okay. <laughs> yes. If I have a few others to get that one going, I I can I can pay that price. Gotcha. Uh, Marson, is there uh, anything else that we have uh, for Jay? Uh, I think I think that kind of wraps up. But I guess we just kind of wanted to, you know, thank you for you know taking the time to have this conversation with us. Oh, sure. And we also kind of wanted to, you know, ask you if you had any projects you wanted to share that you're working on in the future, something that you wanted to, you know, let let the fans know. Um, or if um, you have NDAs. <laughs> yeah, there there are some. I mean, I'm I'm allowed to talk about some stuff. Um, the there was a, a show that um, I worked on a couple of years ago called Princess Principal, which. Um, it's actually it's a um, it's a it's a spy show set in London during the Victorian era. So it's kind of some steampunk elements to it, and um, it's mostly a a cast of of uh, actresses who are portraying like nobility um, kind of princess and duchess like characters, but quite young that are spies. And I play their arch nemesis, a guy named the Duke of Normandy. Um, that was super fun for me because I, I got to break out the crisp British accent. Like he's in the top hat and tails all the time. Nice. Um, you never see him without. So uh, super fun character. And uh, that series was a couple of years ago, but they just came out with a movie where he where he gets to come back. So I, uh, I know I'm clear to talk about that. Uh, I would recommend people seek that out. And then um, Food Wars season five has um has or is coming i think it's on and i think it's out i think it's out on blue right now uh and so that is um the supposed final season of food wars uh where we get to kind of get all get all loose ends tied up i have heard rumors about some ovas um for food wars so i'd be more than ecstatic to learn that that was something that's happening and i've been asking for um for spinoffs on this show for a while like i would love to meet um soma's grandparents joichiro's parents um like what are they like and mm -hmm. what were they thinking sending their letting their 15 year old son joichiro drop out of cooking school and just go off to brazil or saudi arabia or wherever you went <laughs> um on his on his journey as the wandering chef so um yeah there's there's a there's a few things people might uh might be on the lookout for that's wonderful awesome. um also i guess where where can people follow you i know we have you on twitter as well that is, is that, yeah is that twitter? is that is mostly it for me i'm i am not uh not that prolific on social media i've been getting increasing pressure to uh, <laughs> do instagram um but uh i don't know i don't know how much how many photographs of this face people want I, <laughs> maybe if i start cosplaying then i'll have something or uh, just do a short voice clips would be great too that would be I, a fun thing right you know. yeah, all right i'm i'm willing to consider it thank okay. you for the, all right, right. <laughs> that has pushed me a little further in the right direction maybe yeah, right now right now it's twitter uh i'm at j hickman md um like the doctor but not a doctor um I just, they went on television so yeah it's at jay hickman on md on twitter i i try to keep up pretty uh pretty closely with announcing what's going on with projects and, and what's upcoming and if i'm going to be at a convention or or some other sort of um yeah, screening or fan event i'll announce it there and and love to uh love to meet new folks are you doing any awesome. conventions in the near future 
Yeah, pretty um, pretty soon. I think uh, May is going to be the first one. It's Anna Minneapolis, which is in, as you'd guess, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Nice. Um, and then uh, I think after that, it's going to be July and August. There's a couple more. I think it's going to be Anime Midwest, and then it's going to be Anime Houston. Um, and there's some other stuff still sort of percolating for the end of the year, but at least there's a decent handful coming up in the spring. Awesome. I'm in Very Chicago, cool. so I might stop on by an anime Midwest. That'd be great. That would be great. Yeah. That'd be awesome. I will uh, I will buzz you before I'm headed that way. Cool. Sweet. So awesome. Well, I think that's gonna wrap things up for us. Jay, once again, thank you for coming on. It's been a pleasure Absolutely. learning more about the process and everything else. It's been so much fun. Thank you again. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Thanks for having me.